Just a thought. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome uh, to today's Grand Rounds presentation. Uh, please remember to fill out your attendance record. Also, please remember to fill out the program evaluations, and uh, if you have any ideas that you could give the uh, CME committee in regards to future topics or future speakers, uh, we would appreciate that. Um, our speaker today is Dr. John Graves. Uh, I've known Dr. Dr. Graves for a long time. Uh, he uh, is a nephrologist and hypertension specialist. He did his, uh, or the majority of his postgraduate training at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, from there, uh, he went to West Virginia, where he was uh, an assistant to professor of medicine and ran the hypertension clinic from there to uh, uh, Bowman Gray, where he did the same thing. From there, uh, here to uh, McFarland and Mary Greeley, where for approximately 10 years he uh, was the Department of Nephrology and uh, was instrumental in building actually the dialysis units in, in Marshalltown and out on Dayton Road. Uh, subsequently, uh, went to the Mayo Clinic, uh, where he was uh, associate uh, professor of uh, medicine at the Mayo Clinic School of uh, Medicine uh, and a consultant, and currently is a emeritus professor. Uh, uh, John has been extensively published in the peer-reviewed literature, and, and I think, as I mentioned last time he was here, uh, actually authored my go-to reference, uh, Dialysis for the Disinterested. Um, and he's here uh, today to update us on uh, hypertension pharmaceutics in 2014. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Graves. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me back. I very much appreciate the chance to be in Ames. I uh, was hoping it was going to be green here. Uh, it certainly isn't in Rochester. We're uh, dirty brown, having just gotten rid of our snow. So, declarations. I have no conflict of interest. There'll be no off-label usage discussed. And yes, I am still a Cornhusker fan. I also saw some really cool quotes, uh, since it is the baseball season again, about the 50 greatest quotes about baseball. And this is Tulula Bankhead, who thinks there are two, only two authentic geniuses, Willie Mays and Willie Shakespeare. I noticed I didn't make that list, so you'll have to include that when you look at the quality of information that you're going to get today about me and hypertension. The goals today, we're going to address goal blood pressure. I'm going to go through 12 what I think are reasonably important questions about hypertension therapeutics. I'll leave some time at the end, I hope, but this is a brand new talk that I've made for you, so I'm not quite sure on the timing, but I'll try and leave some time at the end. And as always, um, my family is the most important thing in my life, and so I'm going to update you a little bit about my family and how they're doing since we left Ames. Speaking of my family, my wife is in the back. I see she did make it. She came down with me today. And this is a picture, the most recent one I have of her. Uh, she is in the middle, in case you had a hard time guessing. Uh, taken at the Subaru dealership two weeks ago when we got her a new car. Uh, fellow on the right is our uh, Subaru salesman, Tim. Fellow on the left is Marcus Shields. He is a Rochester native and a defensive back and kick returner for the Minnesota Vikings. My wife and I, since we were here last two years ago, continue our travels. We love traveling together. We went to the International Society of Hypertension meeting in Sydney. We traveled via Tokyo, where it appears we awoke Godzilla, because he's going to uh, appear on the, TV, the movie screens this uh, May. And we also went to the European Society of Hypertension meeting in Milan, and were able to zip down to Rome for a day and continue our pursuit of the popes. We uh, had an audience with Pope John Paul II in 2004, had a benediction by Pope Benedict when we were in Rome over the 1st of January in 2011. Unfortunately, we didn't connect with Pope Francis. We're going to go back to uh, Rome in 2015 and hope that he will be around then and, and not be so standoffish this next time. Uh, my wife and I will celebrate our 30th wedding anniversary this fall. So what is goal blood pressure? Well, for everybody but JNC8, and I will discuss JNC8 later in the talk, it's less than 140 over 90. And every hypertension society on earth, save JNC8, agrees that that's the premise. And the most important thing is that we've given up on lower blood pressures. 
You'll remember that earlier in this decade, there was a great deal of talk about um, pre-hypertension, about lower targets for certain subgroups in hypertension, and that has gone by the wayside. So that 140 over 90 is the treatment target for hypertension. The most recent information in that regards comes from the SPS3 study, secondary prevention of small subcortical strokes, i.e. lacunar infarcts. This is a trial that I was in at Mayo Clinic. We were the second largest provider of patients for this international study. And what we found was that there was no improvement in outcomes in this group with increased aggressive lowering of blood pressure. And if you'll look at this, let me try and use my pointer. Okay, here we go. Um, what you'll see is they were randomized to two groups, 130 to 140 over 149, and the mean achieved blood pressure was 134, or less than 130, and the mean achieved blood pressure was 124. And you can see that when you separate them out by age, gender, diabetes, race, continent, we had patients that were in the United States, Canada, several countries in Latin America, and in Spain in this trial, that other than Spain, which was hard to figure out, there was no difference between the groups in aggressive lowering of blood pressure versus non-aggressive lowering of blood pressure. This trial also had an antiplatelet arm. They were randomized to either aspirin or aspirin plus Plavix, and that arm did also not show a significant improvement in aggressive platelet therapy. Yellow? Yeah, Length of follow-up mean was 3.2 years. Mean of 3.2 years. There were also no difference in secondary endpoints in the trial. So myocardial infarction, other forms of stroke, and death were not significantly different in either the um, uh, aggressive treatment of blood pressure or aggressive treatment of platelet therapy. And you see that here as well. This just shows the over time. And we had treatment follow-up out to eight years, and the mean treatment was about 3.2 years. So the first question, is there a holy grail? Is there one drug that works best for hypertension? And I think the best place to go look for that is the largest treatment trial of hypertension. That's the All Hat study. Now, forgive me, please don't look at the bottom half of this. I made these slides myself with uh, MacBook Pro, and uh, I couldn't get rid of the bottom part of this. What I want you to look at is the upper part, and what you're looking at is the patients who were followed for more than one year in all hat, who were treated with only a single of the monotherapy choices in all hat, which were amlodipine, chlorthalidone, or lisinopril. And what you then see, whoop, there they go, is if you looked at chlorthalidone versus amlodipine, chlorthalidone one, and if you looked at lisinopril versus chlorthalidone, chlorthalidone one. What you need to know is that in this trial, only about 30% of the 42,000 people in the study controlled on a single agent. We'll come back to that premise later on in the talk. But if one were to say, okay, if I wanted to have a single agent for hypertension, the answer would be a thiazide diuretic. Second question, all right, based on the first question, what drug then is the best to start people on for hypertension? And the answer is, well, if only 30% of people control on one drug, you're going to need two. So what you want is the best drug and then something to combine it with. And so what you're saying is thiazides plus what comes in a single pill that you can combine with a thiazide. And so what you see is on the top of the list then you have to have an alter alternative for people who can't be on thiazides. So people that have a sulfa allergy, people that have 
hypokalemia or hyponatremia at baseline, then you have the calcium channel blockers, the dihydropyridines, and the drugs that they combine with in a single pill. So I would propose that these are the choices for initial therapy for hypertension based on those premise. Question three. One of the common things that we run into is people who have developed angioedema on ACE inhibitors. And in those patients, you say to yourself, well, gee, can I use an ARB or a direct renin inhibitor in those people? Well, McKenna wrote a review article in 2012 and said, gee, I'm going to answer that question for you. And then he promptly sort of didn't. What he did was look at trials where these drugs were given head to head and found the following results. First, oops, there we go. He found that ACE inhibitors were twice as likely to cause angioedema as ARBs. Oops, I'm going to go back, sorry. Second, he found that ACE inhibitors were far more likely to cause angioedema in congestive heart failure trials than they were in trials of hypertension or coronary artery disease. Something about heart failure seemed to increase the likelihood that angioedema was going to occur. I won't go through this because I'll show you a slide that I just went across a second ago that expresses it better. In fact, I'll show you now. So here's the overall incidence of angioedema with all of these compounds. Anybody remember omipatrolat? Omipatrolat came out, or sort of came out in 2000. It was a neutral endopeptidase inhibitor that also had angiotensin converting enzyme properties and was touted to be our answer for severe hypertension because initial studies showed that it markedly reduced systolic blood pressure. The problem with it was that it caused a lot of angioedema. And the kind of angioedema it caused was severe as opposed to mild, and it caused it with the first or the second dose of the medication, whereas angioedema with ACE inhibitors can occur anywhere out to three years after you start the medication. So this drug didn't get past its first review of the FDA and never came to the marketplace again. And to my knowledge, no other parent compounds similar to it have further been tested. But if one looks at the ACE inhibitors, ARB, Aliskarin, placebo, thiazides, his contention in his review was that ARBs, Aliskarin, actually don't cause angioedema that those drugs just have angioedema occur in patients who can get angioedema, similar to what you see with thiazides and calcium channel blockers. What he didn't do was tell us the answer to the question that was asked, which is, okay, if someone has angioedema on an ACE inhibitor, can you put them on a Liskra? Can you put them on an angiotensin receptor blocker? didn't answer that one. What's my answer to that one? Well, medical legally, what you have to do is prove that you really need that kind of compound, that you need to interrupt the renin-angiotensin-aldosteronism. So in my practice, it's someone who has severe nephrotic syndrome, severe congestive heart failure, and I've proven I can't get by without one of those compounds. So I, I've used an alpha blocker, I've used hydralazine, I've used minoxidil, all those other things, and the person's an abject failure without a drug that interferes with renin angiotensin aldosterone. And after I've put all that in their chart, then it's reasonable to go back and accept the risk of angioedema because you've shown that they need the compound. Then and only then is the risk-benefit ratio is acceptable because there's no literature documentation that shows what the risk is otherwise. Family member number two. This is number two son, Brian. 
He is holding his favorite all-time book, the 50th anniversary of Green Eggs and Ham. And Brian can tell you the anniversary of every TV show, movie, or book on the face of the planet. In October, Brian was disconnected from the hip of my wife, and he moved out into his own apartment in a group home about eight minutes from where we live. Brian works five days a week in the Rochester Public Library. If you go to their website, they've actually done a film documentary of the quality of his work. And the Rochester Post Bulletin is going to be doing a story next week on the work that he does for them. So we're actually quite proud of the little booger, of the things that he can do with his autism, and that he's now living on his own and doing very well. In fact, we can't get him to come back home. When we ask him, you want to come home for Easter? You want to come home for the weekend? Nope, I got my apartment. See you later. Bye. You guys are duds. We didn't, we're not interested in being home with mom and dad. Question four. Which dihydropyridine should you use for hypertension? And when you go to the international meetings, there are at least 20 of them. And it's sometimes quite confusing trying to keep the brand and the trade name straight from all the different booths that you see. There are at least six in the U.S. Brand names on the left, trade names on the right. I would suggest that the drug of choice is philodipine. And the reason is I don't have to worry about, at least in my institution, the computer yelling at me about the interaction between the statin the patient is on and the dihydropyridine that I want to pick. The reason for the other ones is the BID dosing part of it. So that I have become in the last few years a philodipine person only because it leads to the least problems for me as I'm going through medication printing and prescriptions because of the FDA and its issues with statins. Philodipine doesn't have that. Question five, best drug for hypertension. Well, best drug for hypertension turns out to be the fewest number of pills. There is a strong psychology amongst patients because if I had a dollar for every time I had the patient say, I don't want to take pills, I would have retired at 55, not 60. And there's a psychology to that. We all know about it. And we know that they're going to need at least two drugs for their hypertension, and many need three. So it's back to the future, Marty. When I got into medicine in 1974 in medical school, there was Serapis, three drugs for hypertension, single pull. Well, here we are in 2014, Antonide and Tribensor, three drugs for hypertension, one pill. So it's that same idea that you can get where you need to go with one, two, or three medications for hypertension, you're still talking one pill. This will make your patients very, very happy because they don't want to take a fist full of pills to control their blood pressure. And I mentioned we'd come back to All Hat. This is All Hat again, showing you, and it's a little faint. The gold is diastolic blood pressure less than 90. The green is systolic blood pressure less than 140. And the purple is both of them less than 140 over 90. Year zero, oops, there's my pointer. Here we go. Zero, and then to year five. And then it just shows you it took 1.4 to two medications to get there. 62% were on two or more drugs, and then once again, only 30 were on one drug to control their blood pressure. Question six. Well, you know, what's the best drug for fill in the disease? Diabetes, chronic kidney disease, congestive heart failure. What's the best drug for that? Well, wait a minute. For all of the diseases I mentioned, the best thing you can do for them is control their blood pressure. That's the best thing. And then, since we're talking about, for most of them, a two-drug regimen or more, you can put any drug there you want. So if you really feel for your diabetic they have to be on an ACE inhibitor, well, fine, include it in their two-drug regimen. I don't care as long as you control their blood pressure. If you want to see the best drugs, there they are. Fine, pick it. 
but just make sure you control their blood pressure as long as you included that in their regimen because the main thing is control their blood pressure. Question seven. Renal denervation, where does it stand? Renal denervation was supposed to be the therapy for the treatment of hypertension and the Simplicity 3 trial, which finished um, last November, uh, was a failure, which meant there was no difference between people who were denervated and those who were not. The Simplicity 4 trial, which was the follow-on trial, and both of these we were in at Mayo Clinic, was uh, the enrollment for that trial was discontinued. St. Jude Medical, which also has a catheter similar to the um, one that's uh, by Medtronic doing Simplicity, that trial was also stopped, not because Medtronic's trial was um, a failure, but because it was very difficult to get people to enroll in their trial. And that's because in all these trials, you have to ask somebody to go through a sham arteriogram, meaning they have an arteriogram and they don't get de-innervated. At the recent American College of Cardiology meeting in March, Medtronic's excuse for the failure of their trial was that they couldn't tell whether the patients had actually been de-innervated meaning when you go in with a catheter and you stick it in the renal artery and you do your burn around the artery to de-innervate that renal nerve, there at this time is no tool to measure whether indeed you did what you thought you did. There is a company in the Twin Cities that uh, we at Mayo Clinic met with about four years ago that thinks they can do that, but that tool has been validated in dogs only. It hasn't been validated in humans. So that, that is one of the concerns about this treatment, is there's no way to really prove that you've done what you think you did when you're in there. The bigger concern, however, with all of these treatments is that from simplicity to, we know it works. We know in some people it markedly lowers blood pressure. But we also know that it doesn't do what Medtronic's thinks it does, which works in everybody. And we know from going back to the 1960s and looking at resistant hypertension that these people are a polyglot, that they have all sorts of reasons for their severe hypertension and to expect that one treatment would work in them, just like one medicine, an ACE inhibitor, a diuretic, a calcium channel blocker, would work in all of them is ridiculous. So these companies are regrouping, trying to figure out where they go next with their studies. And I suspect that one of the big problems will be that until they can find a way to measure the effectiveness of their treatment, they'll have a hard time getting the FDA to allow them to go forward as a treatment. They may still be able to do studies, but not get into the treatment realm until they can prove that the treatment is actually effective. Son number one, this is Andrew, our firstborn, who is a little over 28, my samurai son. And this picture was taken about a month ago on his yearly sabbatical to Japan. It's taken on a balcony of one of his friends in, who lives in central Japan has nothing to do with what he does for a living. He still works for Wells Fargo. He's doing international loans now. He works in the loan division. Um, he remains highly successful and has survived two purges of the loan division by Wells Fargo. They've downsized twice and haven't gotten him. And uh, he still maintains a strong love for the Japanese language, culture, and people. And uh, so he works like crazy, saves up his money, and then Every year takes two weeks of his vacation and goes to Japan. Question eight, should you use beta blockers in hypertension? The question arises from work that Franz Meserly did in 1999, suggesting that these drugs should not be used for hypertension and that they were associated with an increase in morbidity and mortality 
when used in those subjects. He used primarily the older trials in hypertension to show that information. Weissong, in a paper written last year, used more recent studies and showed that there actually is no difference, that beta blockers are not associated with worse outcomes than more modern therapy for hypertension. Is that important? No, not really. I don't know anybody in practice that preferences beta blockers as initial therapy for hypertension, um, and that's primarily because of side effects. The beta blockers are associated with symptoms of fatigue, drowsiness, and weight gain, which preclude their use in most people for monotherapy for hypertension when taken to the doses that are required to achieve significant reductions in blood pressure. And so beta blockers are relegated to usually third line therapy for hypertension and then use in patients with coronary artery disease and congestive heart failure at the lower doses that are indicated for those diseases. Question nine, should you begin with combination drugs? JNC7 made a large point of this and it was based on three important concerns. Two drugs are commonly needed for hypertension, as we pointed out. Several studies have shown that if you don't get the blood pressure in control within the first six months after diagnosis of hypertension, it's not going to be controlled, and that is important. And there's a single study, which I'll show you, that suggests there's a survival benefit associated with that early control of blood pressure. As an example of the importance or the occurrence of early control, this is the accomplished trial. Um, roughly 10,000 patients at the end of six months, about 60% were on full dose of either the ACE inhibitor and calcium channel blocker or ACE inhibitor and diuretic complication, combination, sorry. And as you can see, that was associated with about 72 to 75% of these people being in control. This is a trial that then raised the bigger concern about the potential benefit of that early control. And this is the VALUE trial. The VALUE trial was sponsored by the people that make Valsartan. And what they wanted to do was show you how wonderful Valsartan was as an angiotensin receptor blocker. And so they conceived a trial between Valsartan and amlodipine, a calcium channel blocker. And what they saw was, okay, most of the blood pressure lowering occurred in the first six months, as expected. And unfortunately, the Valsartan group had a higher blood pressure in the first six months, systolic and diastolic, compared to amlodipine. This difference went away over time. Well, okay, that's, that's probably not a big deal. Except, if one looked at the time-specific odds ratio for events, one saw that there was a significant increase in primary endpoint events in the Valsartan group, a benefit, if you will, in being the, in the amlodipine group, a significant benefit in being the, in the amlodipine group for stroke, myocardial infarction, trivial benefit for heart failure, and a highly significant benefit in being in the amlodipine group for all-cause mortality in the first three months this was sustained a little bit in the first six months and then goes away completely. The only benefit for Valsartan appears down here in the end of the trial, and that was for heart failure. And as one might expect with being on an ARB and their benefits in uh, preload and afterload reduction, which is not accrued with being on a calcium channel block so that this raised great concern that this significant reduction in blood pressure difference that occurred early on was important. 
and of course then screwed up the trial for the sponsor, Valsartan, in showing that this reduction in blood pressure difference that occurred early was, is, was, is and was important in screwing up the long-term results in the trial. So should you begin with combination drugs? And my response is no. What you should do is do what drug studies do, which is start the medications in single and then quickly titrate up to combination therapy, which is what actually happened in that study I showed you, where they had benazapril and amlodipine or benazapril and hydroquithiazide. What they did was start the individual drugs and over six months titrated them to full dose and achieve that level of control. Why? Well, you know, this is aliscrin, hydroclothiazide, and aliscrin. Aliscrin's the open bars, aliscrin, hydroclothiazide's the closed bars. And this is just a classic drug study. You know, this is what they do to look at the effect of the compound in people. And I just want to remind you what these medications can do. And so this shows the, I heard my pointer go again. Here we go. Eight and 12 week reduction in blood pressure. This shows it in less than 55, and I'm not there anymore, over 55, yes. Um, less than 65, over 65, obese, and I'm over BMI of 30 now. Different levels of blood pressure, different levels of GFR, and I cut off the diabetes. That just reminds you how much blood pressure lowering you get. And remember, these are mean levels of blood pressure reduction. So that some people's blood pressure fell 10 and some people's fell 40 to get a mean of 30. Express it a little clearer, here's the same data. Systolic from 167, mean fall of 20. Systolic of 167, mean fall of 30. And then here's the titration out over eight weeks. If you're in your office, and you know that these people are gonna need two drugs. If you give this 67-year-old lady a liscrin hydroclothiazide 3025, and a week later she comes in with an orthostatic event, what's she gonna tell you? The phrase is, I'm never taking that again. You've just now lost an important tool to take care of her hypertension because you know she's going to need two drugs. And she's just now told you that's never happening again. And that means that hydroclothiazide is gone and aliscrin is gone. Well, aliscrin, that's not such a big loss because you got other drugs to replace it there. But hydroclothiazide's gone. She will not take that again because she knows she can't tolerate that medication. Well, of course she can. You just gave her too much of two drugs at one time. Where in fact, what we should have done was start with, you pick which one you want to start with, give her a small amount, see her back in a week, and start titrating her response. Because there's no way of knowing what her response is going to be. Same with his response. Not picking on women. There's no way of knowing. Because these results are means. Some people rise. I could show you an old slide that I have at home from 1957 with hydroclothiazide. Some people's blood pressure with hydroclothiazide goes up 15 millimeters of mercury. Those are the high renin hypertensive patients. So never ever start with combination therapy. Start with one drug, start titrating them, see where they go, but get them in control in six months. And then don't let them take a drug out of your hands just because you decided to start with combo therapy because JNC7 sillily told you that that was a good idea. Question 10. Hyperuricemia and gout. I finally found a rheumatologist who agrees with me. Rare occasion. And fortunately, it actually came from the Cleveland Clinic where I'm from. So this is really cool. Dr. Mandel did a one-minute consult in February of this year from the Cleveland Clinic Journal of Medicine. And he said thiazides are important to the treatment of hypertension. Most rheumatologists won't say that. They'll say, oh, you got to stop. 
Got to stop. You can't, you know, if they got gout, they got hyperuricemia, you got to stop thiazides. You can't. You have to have them for the treatment of hypertension. And he also said that in the usual doses, they don't increase the uric acid that much. Okay? They really don't. He also reminded me that losartan is a weak uricosuric. So that if you're looking to help yourself, switching that second agent from whatever it is to losartan may be of advantage. Um, if you're treating their uric acid, your goal is less than six, unless you're in the UK, but I'm in Minnesota, that's not in the, in the UK, so uh, that's the, my thing that I'm looking for. And then he also reminded me that cardiologists are not your friend, and that when they start them on low-dose aspirin, they're, he they're not helping me, they're hurting me, because low-dose aspirin also increases the uric acid and is also a problem in my patients with hyperuricosemia and gout. So I'm not the only one who's given them problems with my hydroglothiazide. The guy that throws them on the 81 milligram aspirin is also given part of the problem. My hound, that's Casey, the wonder dog. She's with us today too. She travels with us. Um, Casey turned seven this year. Um, She's wondering where the spring is. This, this is less than a month ago in, in Minnesota, so that's, that's how our winter has been. Um, we were hoping maybe to find some nice, slow Iowa squirrels for her to chase while we were down here because she can't catch, catch the Minnesota squirrels. Um, but she's uh, enjoying my retirement because she gets to spend more time with Dad. JNC8, where did they go? Well, I can't believe they even tried to go anywhere. They were three years late. They should have just quit um, because most of what they did made no sense. First of all, they said in patients 60 years or older who do not have diabetes or chronic kidney disease, the gold blood pressure is now less than 150 over 90. Uh, if you're 60 or older, if you run the equation for EGFR, they're all in renal failure. So that's the most nonsensical recommendation I've heard in a, my lifetime. I mean, why did they do that? The second thing is there's no science for that. So that that recommendation is in disagreement with every hypertension society on the face of the planet. And it also is not based in science, and it also makes no sense because of the calculation of EGFR. In patients 18 to 59 with no major comorbidities, you, no, everybody's less than 140 over 90, and that's what all the other societies say. And all they're doing is complicating your life by trying to make you think of things that are not important. It's less than 140 over 90. Then if you're over 80, the um, uh, SISTER trial says that it's less than 150. That's it. First line and later line treatments should now be treat li limited to four classes of medications. Well, that's sort of true. Um, those are the basic first line therapies, but you know that you're going to need some other drugs because A, people are going to be intolerant of some of those, and B, people are going to require three agents in some circumstances. So to be limiting in your recommendations is a foolhardy lesson. The next one, um, patients of African descent without CKD should use CCB and thiazides. That's based on a single study, the ASK study. Okay, fine. The next one. If you look at this one and this one, they're mutually exclusive. It says, use ACE and ARB in all patients with CKD as first-line therapy or in addition to first-line therapy. And then it goes to say, but if you're over 75 with CKD, don't use them. Now, how can you use the word all in a recommendation or guideline statement? I'm on both an American and international guidelines committee. When you use the word all, it has to be all. 
you, you can't have an exception. So these two statements don't go together. So you, <laughs> I, can't, I can't figure out how you can have an all and then turn right around and come down here and say, oh, but if you're over 75, that's not all. So, you know, it's just mass insanity. And then this one is actually correct. You can't use ACE and ARB together because of the on-target trial, which showed an increased risk of renal failure and life-threatening hyperkalemia when you did that. So JNC8 is a disaster. Um, they didn't tell us anything important, and basically it should be ignored with the exception of this recommendation. If you hadn't already seen that in the literature, it's been out there for a couple, three years um, of the results of the on-target trial, then that is a good piece of information to take away. Final question, how to improve hypertension management? Well, four years ago, I suggested in a paper that doctors should stop measuring blood pressure. And this last month, uh, Dr. Clark suggested in the British Journal of General Practice that in a meta-analysis, doctors uh, recorded higher blood pressures in nurses. And I like that paper a lot. Could be because he referenced me four times. Maybe, you know, that could be part of it. But, you know, what he reinforced is that when doctors interact with patients, the blood pressures that they get are ridiculous. They're much, much higher than what is seen with nurses. And as others have shown, including myself, they're much higher than what you see with ambulatory blood pressure. And it reinforces the notion that if we're going to improve hypertension, what we really need to do is get away from the old mechanism of treatment which is to have the doctor taking care of hypertension. And I and several other authors have recommended that we go to what we do in trials, which is the focus of the doctor is to see and evaluate the patient and say, okay, you probably don't have a secondary form of hypertension. Um, here are your comorbidities. Here's the drug you should start with and the dose. Here's what I would probably put you on for a second agent if it's required and the doses of that. And then pass the patient off to a clinic. And the clinic then would be a nurse, a physician's assistant, a nurse practitioner, who would then titrate the patient up to gold blood pressure within six months. And the nurse practitioner would have a protocol for drugs like thiazide diuretics that need laboratory studies and follow-up. ACE inhibitors probably need uh, laboratory follow-up. And the doctor would see the patient back if and only if there were complications or perhaps for a yearly physical. Um, in the new day and age, perhaps every other year physical. And we know that in clinical trials, when you manage blood pressures this way, the control rates are 65 percent. We know in private practice around the world, control rates are 35 to 40 percent. So all we need to do is emulate what we do in trials, and control rates will get better, not the drugs. We just, we're just not doing it right. Last, one last baseball reference from what I think is the most intelligent man in baseball, Yogi Berra. Thank you very much. Questions, please. Thank you, John. Uh, when I'm starting a lisinopril for the first time, how soon should I uh, check uh, the chemistries? And then do I need to in uh, keep checking them after I increase it to 20 and 40? And um, It depends on who you're dealing with. Um, if you're talking about a low-risk patient, then probably 10 days to two weeks. If you're talking about a high-risk patient, so this would be someone with kidney disease, pre-existing hyperkalemia, someone who is on um, 
other drugs like beta blockers where you're worried about the interaction causing hyperkalemia, I do it within 72 hours. So it, it depends on the circumstance. And, and then with the increase in do with the dose change, again, the same intervals based on the risk. Professor Graves, um, the question is, will Bo Pelini still be your best football coach at Nebraska in November of this year? Um, absolutely, and for the next 10 years. I'm sorry the Cyclones can't beat up on him this fall. it that's as much as you're going to beat me up come on now yes in case of hypertensive crisis how fast do you lower the blood pressure um, one should look for a lowering of the blood pressure to around 200 over 110 within the first 24 to 48 hours. Then further reductions of the blood pressure can occur over the next week or two. So that all you're really trying to do with severe hypertension, let's say comes in at 280 over 140. All you want to do is get out of the cardiovascular collapse range in that first 24 to 48 hours. Once you've done that, then you've got all the time in the world. And the mistake that many people make is trying to normalize the blood pressure too quickly. And that can lead to horrible complications because of cerebral and renal autoregulation, which because the patient's seeing and been seeing these severe elevations in the blood pressure, when you lower the blood pressure too fast, you can underperfuse the brain and the kidney and cause cerebral underperfusion and stroke due to that, and renal underperfusion and renal failure due to that circumstance. So all you want to do is get them out of the real crisis zone within that first 24 to 48 hours, then sit there and get their blood pressure normal over the next two to four weeks. Especially important with our um, stroke people, there was just a, a paper published a couple of months ago about stroke where um, our neurology colleagues, if they'll let us lower the blood pressure 20 millimeters of mercury, I'm lucky because their literature says, you know, if you lower the blood pressure you know, a little bit, that's all you get. And then you come back in a month, we'll let you lower it a little bit more and a little bit more because their literature about lowering the blood pressure too much, devastatingly bad things happen in almost all forms of stroke with the exception of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, otherwise, you know, they, they, they won't let us near them. They, they won't even consult us anymore because they're afraid we're going to lower the blood pressure so that they don't let us near their patients. They, they, they're afraid we're going to do too much too soon. Yes, sir. Uh, John, that was a great talk. Welcome back. I uh, uh, wondered if you could speak to the wisdom of taking, for example, a diabetic who's not, you know, got kidney disease, for example. I, a lot of times I see patients with angioedema, and uh, they're on an ACE inhibitor, and I stop it. And risk-benefit, I you know, given... Uh, 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 my desire to use uh, uh, an ARB, it, it, you gave us your own personal approach. Would you characterize it as wrong to use an ARB on a trial basis in such a patient where there's a compelling reason, although not a completely, not a dramatic reason to use an ARB? Do you follow my question? Yeah. Um, you would be hard pressed to not end up losing your house, your retirement account, 
and your firstborn male child, if that diabetic doesn't have a compelling indication for the ARB, if they got life-threatening angioedema again, because there is no evidence that the use of something that interrupts the renin angiotensin aldosterone system benefits them in any way beyond blood pressure lowering. So if you're using it for microalbuminuria and they come in with angioedema and die in the ER, bless me, Father, for I have sinned, just write the check. I'll come down here and I can, I can testify in the trial for them and I guarantee you I will have the jury in tears. I will have them saying that this poor family, that they, they, you owe them everything that there is no reason on God's green earth for what you did. And there's no justification in the medical literature. And I will quote them chapter and verse so that you, you won't be able to find a witness on your side that can possibly stand up to what I will quote in terms of the science. Now, if that person has unremitting nephrotic syndrome and anasarca, if that person has unremitting congestive heart failure, an injection fraction of 15%, that's a compelling indication. And, you know, then if you're saying, you know, I take her off her ARB and she gains 40 pounds and can't walk, good to go. And I will come down here and back you to the hilt and their attorney will be the one that says, damn, that Graves guy just dug us in a hole that I can't get you out of. Okay. So it depends on what the circumstance is. But if it's microalbuminuria, you know, or, or some trivial thing like that that you're treating, the treatment is hypertension management. It's not the use of an ACE or an ARB, and that's what I see with diabetes, is that so many of these diabetics are, you know, is treat their bloody blood pressure and, and get it down. And then, and then the same thing, if you tell me the only thing I've had her on you know, there's a list of antihypertensive medication, and I get patients like that. And the only thing that brings our blood pressure down is something that interrupts renin angiotensin aldosterone. Then we're golden. You know, there's there's the list of 19 drugs. Here's the only one that worked. And, you know, and I've had patients like that. But you know, you got to show me the list of 19 drugs. You know, if if she's only been on a calcium channel blocker and uh, and a thiazide diuretic, and I can put her on labetalol and she's 120 over 70. Goodness gracious, why would you accept the risk of a life-threatening illness? If, um, no, I don't see any ENT guys here. Um, I can remember thinking I was going to pass out with a lady who, the year five or six on Captopril, who we had admitted to the ICU here at Mary Greeley um, at 7 o'clock in the morning, gave her prednisone and Benadryl, and she was doing great. Life was wonderful. This is when I was on first medical call. I hate even saying those words. I hated that so bad. Um, and I came back to check her at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and all of a sudden, her upper airway just was gone. I mean, she had a recurrent flare of her angioedema. And one of the ENT guys and I, I was being first assistant as he was wading into her tracheostomy. Now, that didn't sound too bad, except she weighed close to 300 pounds. And he was having a hell of a time trying to find where her trach was in the middle of the neck. And I can't tell you how bad I didn't want to be there. But it reinforced for me how life-threatening angioedema can be when it goes from she was wonderful life was good i was going home to my wife and kids and she was going to die you know so no i i've give that disease a wide berth a wide wide berth she made it even with me as first assistant on the trach man they talk about a handicap Pull here, where, where, pull what? You gotta be kidding me. I'm an internist. Any other questions? First assistant. <laughs> That's even worse than being on first medical call. <sighs> oh, things you do. 
thank you.